And I think it was a 263, is that the little two engine job? 262. 262? 262, the little two engine. They were so fast that they weren't very maneuverable. And he came sweeping by the formation like that, and a P-51 cut the corner, and I watched him disintegrate in the year. The P-51 got him on that particular mission. Right. <coughs> Here's another one over Fassburg, Germany in April. We usually flew at altitude about 25,000 feet, 20,000 feet up in the air, which is about four, four to five miles high. You really have a ringside seat down here in the ball turret. The ball turret turns 360 degrees around and it turns 90 degrees up and down like this. You, uh, you, uh, the only thing is we're so high in the air at four and five miles that you really can't see too much detail on it. On this one particular mission, for some reason or other, we dropped, we were coming in at 20,000 feet, and then for the bomb run, we took a dive, the whole bomb group. Boy, this was exciting. These things cruised at about 165 miles an hour, as I recall. 150. 150? 150 going in, 170 coming out. Boy, I mean, they were moving. On this particular one, on this particular one, we had a tailwind, and we were going into a dive, and we were up to about 300 miles an hour. Oh, were we excited? Oh, it was something. We dropped down to 12,000 feet on our bomb run, and then climbed back up to altitude, some roller coaster. I think it occurred on this mission, a German 88 millimeter anti-aircraft gun shot four shells in a row. They must have had like clip down there as I were on it. I saw the first three bursts from my turret, boom, 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 and I could see the spacing of them, and I knew where number four was going to hit on it. Uh, it burst directly under us and raised our airplane up in the air. I called in on the intercom that my turret had been hit. You know, sometimes in the heat of the battle and the cold and everything else, you don't really know whether you're hit or, or what condition you're in. But I know it, it hit right underneath us and raised the whole airplane up in the air. And we only found one black hole in the tail from that, from that particular burst on that one. Let me skip back now, backwards, just a, a minute to a typical, kind of a typical day, and I won't cover too much of it. But when we went to the mess hall in the morning time for breakfast, they had two lines. If you're flying combat this day, you got in this line. If you weren't flying combat this day, even though you were an air crew man, you got in this line. The only difference was this line got real eggs and this line got powdered eggs. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the officer in the living <laughs> Yes. It, uh, the food, the food was great, and the and the powder, the real egg line, it was kind of like your last meal, <laughs> so to speak. It, it, made, it really made you feel good. We went to briefing. You know all about briefing with the big maps, and they tell me about the weather and the fighters to expect and what you're going to hit and 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 so forth on the thing. And then, then we left the briefing room, and we had to go pick up our parachutes. They didn't leave them out in the airplane. So they had big bins and you went in and pick up a parachute and I can remember as young man age 19 that we used to actually fight to see who got number 13 parachute. <laughs> Today I think I'd take number 12 or 14. In the, uh, in the locker room we donned our flight clothes. The airplanes only had a single sheet aluminum wall and were not insulated. The temperature at altitude was off of minus 40 degree range. Uh, let me discuss, uh, tell you about the wardrobe just a quick minute here. Long John cotton underwear, wool slacks, wool long sleeve shirt, then a heated suit over the top, which was kind of a lightweight material, almost like a nylon material. And it had little wires in it, like a heated blanket. It was a, a bib overall, and then you had a little jacket that went over the top. 
Then you had little, little uh, uh, connections between the band of your sleeve and your gloves because it, you had one pair of gloves that had little wires in them like a heated blanket. And then you had a snap down here and the snap went into your, into kind of a felt shoe that you had inside of your shoe that was also heated. And it even had a snap up here, a little wire that went into your goggles with little wires in the goggles like the rear end of your automobile nowadays, the defroster deal. So we had a, we had, we had some heat if they, if they worked. Then on top of that heated suit, next we had a nylon, nylon type jumpsuit with many pockets in it and it had a full length zipper up the front. And then we topped it off with a leather flight jacket. We won't discuss it in detail. I'll leave it. I'll leave it to your imagination. But you you see how many uh, uh, you see how many uh, layers of clothing we had on, <coughs> and zippers and buttons and snaps and everything else. And on top of that, then we had a then we put a rubber May West on, which wasn't inflated. If you ever wait in the water, you pull a little thing and it inflates. But you had that on, and then on top of that, you had your parachute harness on, which came around here and came through your crotch here, and you. Since that up was tight. Let's just say if you ever had to go to the bathroom, you were in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> and we could tell you a story or two about that. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, is this off the record? Okay. One time, one time the navigator and bombardier in the front end had a little relief tube up there. And they're supposed to call them back here to the ball turret and tell them. Well, one time they forgot to tell, and my turret was facing frontwards. And boom! You have a little round window about that big between your legs. That's your siding window. They, that's the whole thing in the turret. Yeah, that thing was ice, just like that. And my waist gunner, this on a combat mission, the waist gunner had to lay down on the floor with a walk around oxygen bottle on and take a little plate off behind the turret in the floor, about that big with four Zeus nuts, and lay down on his side so that his whole arm filled up the whole hole so he couldn't see what he was doing. He's out there in the slipstream with a screwdriver, and I'm on, we're both on the intercom, and I'm saying, a little more to the left and a little more to the right. <laughs> as, he scraped off, as he scraped off my window. <laughs> you don't read that in every book. Every book. Well, anyway, going back to the clothes, up on our head we had a leather helmet with built-in earphone, earphones and, uh, and the heated goggles we told you about. On our hands we wore a pair of silk gloves, then we had a pair of electric heated gloves, then we had a fur-lined leather glove, and then we had a bunky mitten. That's four layers, four layers on, on our hands. The feet, we had wool socks felt electric heated shoe, a leather GI shoe, and then an insulated cloth overboot. So you actually had four layers on the feet. I already told you about the about the good good buddies upstairs in the in the heat. The ground crews, boy I can't say enough about the ground crews. That's a story all by itself and someday if you haven't had you ought to have a, maybe a ground crew guy here. You see the 8th Air Force, the Americans flew in the daytime only. And the Royal Air Force flew in the nighttime only. On my first mission to Kassel, Germany, we hit Mac Castle three days straight, and the RAF hit Kassel three nights straight. 72 hours that they plastered Castle. And by the way, we were putting in the air at that time over 1,200 airplanes a day. I've talked about bombers, not by We had about 600 fighters, as I recall, buzzing around us like flies. P-38s, P-51s, and P-47s. But, the, but they put a lot of bombers in the air. A bomb group like we were at Grafton Air Force Base, a bomb group put, was four squadrons. The, uh, the base was about 50 airplanes. Four squadrons of 12 each. 12, 12, 12, 12. You flew for three days, that meant one squadron was on the ground, and the other three squadrons put 12 airplanes in the air plus two spares. So when I was flying, we were putting 38 aircraft in the air at a time each day. 
you take off down there, after you take off, one of our jobs is, as uh, gunners and so forth, we, you know, we weren't bombardiers, we weren't ready to drop the bombs. We were the eyes and the ears. The pilots up front, you can't see what's out, out there, out there. We said, there's another aircraft with a, uh, with a triangle P on it. So there, there's a, that car is one of is a black triangle P. That stood for our particular bar group. You're in the air with hundreds of these airplanes circling at different altitudes. And you're supposed to go to a certain altitude to rendezvous with your other 38 aircraft. So you're trying to find another one with a triangle P, a black one. And then he's trying, you find one and the two of you stick together until you find a third one and a fourth one. So you spend about an hour around the air before you ever head out, head east on a thing. So our job was constantly, there's one over there at 3 o'clock, there's one at 10 o'clock, one down there at 2 o'clock and so forth. We were constantly calling out other aircraft for the rendezvous on a thing. I, I mentioned briefly about the ground crews. I told you we flew in the daytime. That meant the ground crews had to work all night. One day we loaned our airplane. We were on the ground. It was our fourth day we were on the ground, but they used the airplane anyway. Some other crew took our airplane up. They got a direct burst of flak in the tail. It killed the tail gunner. The airplane was able to make it back to the base. But that night, the ground crew took the whole tail off the airplane put a whole new tail on, and we flew it on combat the next morning. I mean, they were miraculous. Another time, we got a big piece of flak in a, in a wing tank, in one of our wing tanks, and they took the whole wing off, replaced the tank, and put the wing back on overnight and had it ready to go. They, all, in the, all in that blooming, cold, foggy English weather, outside, no, not, not inside of hangars, outside right out where they're all parked and dispersed out there on it. No, they were, they were just absolutely phenomenal. When we, so we're, uh, anyway, after we pick up all, we went to the uh, gun shop. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> 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 and on behalf of myself, <laughs> We went to the, we went and got our parachutes, we went to the dressing room, we got all this dress stuff on, and we went to the gun shack to get our guns. Now we left the outside of the gun, was always in the, in the turret or in the airplane, but the inside, what we call the guts of the gun, were taken to a gun shack each day. We had to pick those up, I had two fifties, gave them all, we load them into GI trucks, but take them out, we had to install them, put them inside of our gun uh, casings, and check them all out and so forth. So we were busy doing that on the thing. Now we're almost ready to uh, we're almost ready to take off. There's two pictures of all here. You might glance at over here. One over here. Some here's one here. The pilots they just sat up in the sat up in the cockpit and pressed the button or whatever. You any pilots here? Whatever you guys did up there, you, I mean, they just press the button to start the motors. We lucky GIs, they got, they got four engines on those things with big three-bladed propellers. We had to get out there and pull those propellers through. Now, they don't move easy. I mean, you reach way up there and pull that thing down, and we had to turn each one of them three or four times. Tell them why you had to pull them through all blades. Tell them why you had to pull it through before they get started. I assume, I assume it was to loosen them up. Uh, and get the oil from on. the bottom cylinders up into the other cylinders. Well, we're bringing the oil yeah. up to the top. I knew they were doing something. Yeah. I thought they were just keeping us busy, like right? yeah. when we had to pick up papers. <laughs> 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 just until we start them, it's all ahead right yeah. off. <laughs> but your, your pilot wasn't very good. We, we helped the enlisted men pull those blades through. <laughs> we were working right with the, the enlisted men pulling the, the engines through. Well, I think our, my, ours must have been there later on and they learned a few tricks. <laughs> no, I, I flew the last mission the Air Force flew. Is that right? Yes, sir. From Grafton Underwood? From Molesworth. From Molesworth. Okay. You know, uh, I'm a ground crewman, in fact, a flight engineer. But anyway, we never let those those uh, 
chauffeurs sit up in the airplane. <laughs> Believe me, we didn't pull them through alone. We said, hey, you're going along, let's pull them through. You pull this side, we'll pull that. So we made them work on 29s. <laughs> Good. Another thing we did on takeoff. On takeoff, we took all of our flak suits, anything heavy that we could get, climbed up through the bomb bay, down through the cockpit area, and into the nose. With a nine-man crew, you had three up in the cockpit, the pilot, co-pilot, and flight engineer. The other six of us were all down in that plexiglass nose of that thing for takeoff. The, you know, the safest spot, so to speak. I remember that, remember that runway coming along, when they, when they release those brakes and those motors just are revving up and the things are shaking with 2,700 gallons of gas and about eight tons of bombs and uh, all the ammunition and everything. And we would watch that out there. You can see that runway going by like that and, and you're still on the ground. And you can see the end coming up and you're still on the ground. <laughs> Many times when the concrete gave out and the grass started, you can see those blades of grass going. They should have added about two inches onto the end of that runway, just for morale purposes. <laughs> we were alert all the way going in for fighters, for, for uh, other aircraft and so forth. They, let me tell, tell you about, uh, about uh, um, formation flying. When we did bombing, particularly late in the war and probably earlier on too, they flew formation and we were flying a uh, 12 aircraft in a, in a squadron. We flew 444, four, four, four diamond. You had strut, two wingmen, and another one in the bottom, we called it in the bucket type of deal. They flew so tight, particularly on the bomb run, because they did pattern bombing. And many times they had an experienced bombardier in the very front aircraft, <coughs> and he would we would all open our bomb bay doors ready to go, and when he hit his bombs, when he let them go, we just hit a, hit a switch. Later on in the war, they had relaced, replaced some of the bombardiers with an enlisted who were an officer, with an enlisted man who was a sergeant, was called a toggleer. And he wasn't as trained as the bombardier was and so forth, but he knew enough which switches to push and how to open the bomb bay door and so forth. So many times he would just hit that salvo switch when, when the, that was one reason for the, for the tight formation flying. The other reason was for firepower. When a fighter's coming up at the bottom of my ball turret, if it's just me, he's facing 250 calibers. But if he's coming at the bottom of 38 aircraft in our bomb group, now he's, as he passes through, he's facing 76 50 caliber machine guns aimed at him. I don't think I'll come in from the bottom. I think I'll try the top. 76 50s at the top. I think I'll come in at the front. 76 50s at the front. I think I'll come in at the rear. 76 50. You get the idea? Firepower. Firepower. As a result, late in the war, we didn't have many fighters, and what we did have were very respectful of the firepower on the on the thing. Oxygen checks. We would we put on our oxygen masks the minute we hit ten thousand feet. So many times we were on oxygen for eight hours on a thing. Like I say, we did not eat on a thing. If you're without oxygen at high altitude for just a few minutes, and it depends on how high you are. If you go higher, it's the time is shorter, and if you're working, the time is shorter. Anyway, they had oxygen checks, as I read. You read like three minutes. That's what I had in my notes here. I, that's what I thought it was. But I thought, gee, that sounds awful, awful quick. But every three minutes, the bombardier, you see, wasn't doing any bombing on the way going in and coming out. So one of his jobs up front on the intercom was to say, oxygen check. And everybody answered in turn. Tail OK, waist OK, ball OK, radio OK, top turret OK. And so everybody answered. One day, he says, oxygen check. Tail okay, waist okay. Somebody didn't answer. My oxygen supply had come unattached for 
some unknown reason, and I had passed out. You have no, absolutely zero feeling. You don't know anything about it. You don't know either going out or coming back in. My waste gunner had to put, get off of oxygen, put into what we call a walk-around oxygen bottle, come back, crank my turret up by hand from the outside, because they chip it up till the, till the door is now on the inside of the aircraft, and then reach down and put me on 100% oxygen to bring me to on the thing. This is, this is quite a lot of war stories about oxygen deals, particularly where the tail gunner passed out, and one guy goes back to save the tail gunner, and he passes out, now the airplane's flying like this, and, and those kind of things. So a very important oxygen check, oxygen check, oxygen check, all the way through. My, uh, I mentioned flak, my bombardier was hit twice, one piece, came, one piece of flak came through the plexiglass nose, hit the uh, little strap that comes down holding his oxygen mask on, has little, little metal ta uh, buttons, he hit one of those metal buttons, which slowed it down, and it just nicked his upper lip a little bit. We had a spare oxygen mask that punctured the mask and that, he, that he wore. Another time, a piece came through the front end and went through his gloves and just nicked, just nicked one of his knuckles there a little bit. Uh, Auto thing. Another time, a large piece came through the cockpit at the top of the cockpit and hit the pilot right in the chest. A rather large piece. He had his flak suit on and it dropped in his lap. He was, he was lucky. Was your turret ever hit? <laughs> but I, the turret might have been hit a time too, but I never had any, any uh, holes in it uh, that, that, I, that I knew of. On it. Let's see, we talked about formation flying, we talked about oxygen um, on it. Firepower. Let me discuss briefly about the lower ball turret. Let me show you show you one one quick picture here of the uh, ball turret. This one uh, you're welcome to look at afterwards. This happened to be on Life Ma Life magazine. It is one of the best pictures of the ball turret that I have seen. And the, uh, the ball turret, the ball turret gunner, you never ride in the ball turret during landing and takeoff. In fact, you can't get in it. You can't get in it. Because if you're, you're down on the ground, you turn it like that, the big guns would hit the, hit the ground. And you can't get, you have to put the turret all the way down to 90 degrees so the guns point down, and it brings the door up inside the airplane. You open the door, you climb in, you close the door behind you, and now you're in a solid steel ball about half inside the airplane and about half outside. <coughs> now that you're inside, the ball will rotate 360, 90 degrees, and so forth. You hit two little, two little levers up here, like this, up and down, round and round, and so forth. And you sit in there for about eight hours, like this. The ball is rolling right, right around the back of it here. And you're looking through a window between your legs, with two fifty calibers going right down the right down the side of your leg like this, on a thing, and that's that's the way you sit for hours and uh, do this to keep the circulation going. So much for the so much for the turret, and uh, I mentioned about getting the parachutes. Every, we all had parachute harnesses on, but you had, we had, most of us had chest chutes, although I think the pilots or the <coughs> navigators, somewhere had a, you had a backpack chute, didn't you? You had a backpack that you always had on. It was, it was always like... V8. Huh? They were a V8 pack. Okay, but it was worn on the back, right? Down the back. Slim, but, yeah. Kind of slim, but down the back. Yeah. But the other, the rest of us had a, had a harness on with two snap rings, and then you had this little chute under <laughs> someplace. And if you ever had to go out, you grab that chute and snap it to your range and you're ready to go. Everybody could wear a parachute except the ball turret gunner on the thing. So uh, and if you ever had, with this formation flying, <coughs> one day on one of our missions, I was watching out my turret and our two wingmen bumped together. 
One of them started there like that. The other one, the wings just folded up like a big paper airplane. 18 men in them, and I didn't see any parachutes on the thing. The only way to get out of the ball turret at that time is your power is probably off. You have to crank the turret up by hand, get inside the airplane, put your chute on, and go out the waist door. No time. Right. Now let me wind, wind it up here in a minute. Just the very tail end. After the war was over, two little incidents. Number one, we moved to southern France, to Istres, France, down by the Mediterranean. We took all the guns and armor plates out of our of our B-17s and put plywood benches in them, going the length of the airplane. We carried 30 passengers. They didn't need ball turret gunners anymore at that time, so they made me the steward taking care of the passengers. <laughs> For six months, I had some wonderful trips all over Europe taking care of passengers, both civilian and military, in the, in the B-17. That's a, that's a little separate story. Um, <clears throat> My pilot, John Blagg, uh, on, was going on pass from Istres, France, with another crew. They hit an icing condition at Lyon, France, and the aircraft went down, and, uh, and uh, five of them, five were killed, including my pilot, who didn't make it back. <coughs> we just wind it up with one, little, with one little story. When my daughters want to date me, they say, hey, Dad, tell us about those old airplanes that had propellers. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for your time. Uh, once again, a member of the minority religions in the state of Utah, I have been outranked by the Mormon bishop. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite. I specifically asked him to address the subject of where he slept, what did he eat, what was his social life, where did he go, what did he do on an average day, including who did he sleep with, <laughs> and whatever. <laughs> to give you the feel of what the average GI other than the feller plus the feller in the combat crews. So I want to thank you very much. It's not often that somebody steals my show. <laughs> Thanks, Lee. But you did it. Thanks, Lee. And I want to thank you very, very much. Now, what we're going to show here is about six or seven transparencies which show the type of barracks that you lived in and other things associated with your daily life as a GI, and you can comment on it as we show the transparencies. Okay. Good. 